Well, good morning, church. It is uh, hard to believe, but this morning we are wrapping up our series in the book of Galatians. When we started this series and we were praying through it as a team and thinking about what we wanted to name it, we named it The Immutable Gospel, and I think that title proved to be very appropriate because week after week we were able to expound upon the central message of Scripture that our only hope is in the pure, genuine, and unchanging gospel. We preached Christ crucified. We preached the cross plus nothing. We preached the sufficiency of the atoning work of Jesus Christ. We preached the sufficiency of Scripture. We preached Grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone, through the truth of the Scripture alone. The immutable gospel. So it's fitting that this morning we're going to close out the book of Galatians and we're going to stick to that same theme. We'll be in Galatians chapter 6, looking at verses uh, 11 through 18. So if you have your Bibles Please turn there a while, and we'll give you a heads up. Last week, I I faded at the end. I was not feeling good last week. I feel great this morning, but my cough is still with me, so if you see me popping a cough drop, that is why. I've entitled this morning's message, A True Believer. And as we've seen in the book of Galatians, and I'm sure you have seen in your own life, there is a difference between the true and the false. There's a difference between the genuine and the fraudulent. But sometimes, imposters are hard to spot. Have you ever been fooled by someone? Have you ever believed someone to be something only to find out that their character is far from what you believed? I don't know about you, but um, that is true. And there are people like that. And has anybody ever heard of a man named Ferdinand de Mara. Ferdinand de Mara is better known as the great imposter. It is said that he had a photographic memory. He had an extremely high Q. And he used his wit to execute an impressive string of stolen identities. In 1957, Time Magazine described him as this, audacious, unschooled, but amazingly intelligent pretender who always wanted to be someone and succeeded at being a whole lot of somebody else's. The great imposter was a civil engineer, a zoologist, a doctor of applied psychology. On two separate occasions, he became a monk. He was an assistant warden at a Texas prison. He was from time to time or he was at one time the dean of philosophy at a university. He held roles as a hospital orderly, a lawyer, and a teacher. But it was his last and most notable impersonation that finally exposed him for who he was, an imposter. During the Korean War, Damara impersonated a doctor on a Canadian warship. And his wounded men and combat casualties were brought on board, it was the great imposter's job to save their lives. He was the only quote-unquote surgeon on the ship. Debarra had medical textbooks which he studied on the ship, and somehow he did manage to save many men's lives. He even performed major chest surgery on one wounded soldier. But as news of his heroic spread, He received much media attention. And believe it or not, that's not good news for an imposter. This is eventually what unmasked him. One source that reported the story stated that the impersonation is considerably more difficult when the entire country knows your face. Once his identity was revealed, he could no longer live a fraudulent lifestyle. You see, people are very good at deception. Some people say many of the right things. They even do many of the right things. 
The false can go on and on for long periods of time without being exposed. And imposters of the faith can go on deceiving people for long periods of time too. But eventually, the true is distinguished from the false. Time and truth go hand in hand. False Christians are eventually exposed for who they are. Imposters. But take heart. True believers experience mercy and peace because of the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So with that in mind, let's read today's text. We'll be in Galatians 6, like I said, and I'm going to read verses 11 through 18. It says, You see with large letters I am writing to you, with my own hand, it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither the circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we thank you for your word, the word of truth that has pres- you have preserved, that has stood the test of time, that re- reveals you to us. God, we're thankful for Jesus Christ, his atoning sacrifice on the cross, that he willingly laid down his lives for believers. God, we're thankful for the Apostle Paul who wrote this letter to the Galatians. God, we have a firm understanding of your your grace and your mercy and your peace. Thank you for this congregation. Thank you for our time together. We have to study your word. We pray for a clear mind this morning. pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. So point number one this morning. A true believer protects the gospel. We see this in verses 11 and 12. He says, you see what what large letters I'm writing to to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. The scripture starts by pointing out that Paul says he's writing with his own hand. And he's writing with large letters. And I love when we get to see the humanness of the authors of the Bible. Sometimes I fear that when we read the Bible, we're reading it as if it's fiction or it's make-believe. That is not the case. And sometimes we get a glimpse of the humanness. But it's verses like these that draw me to the reality. This was real life. This was a real person. The Apostle Paul writing a real letter to a real people in a real church. Paul was either saying one of two things. He's either saying, I'm writing so big because my eyesight is failing me. He had let us know that earlier. His eyesight is failing him. So he's either saying, I'm writing so big because I can't see. Or... He's saying, I'm writing not in cursive like the scribes, but I'm printing. So one of those two things is what he's trying to communicate. But either way, he's making the point that it was the content and the substance of the letter that was important, not the style and the presentation of the letter. And he also wanted to make sure that the Galatians knew that this letter was from him. He didn't want them to question the authenticity of the letter. So after verse 11, he quickly turns his attention to his final warning of the Galatian church. He says, It is those who want to make good showing in the flesh 
who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. See, Paul was reading the point that he's hammered home over and over again in the book of Galatians. The Judaizers false teaching of circumcision was not in the best interest of the Galatians. It was in the best interest of the Judaizers themselves. The Judaizers were protecting themselves. They had no interest in protecting the true, genuine gospel message. They wanted the Galatians to get circumcised so that they could boast in themselves. They're teaching aligns with the actions of false teachers today. False teachers protect themselves. The false boast in themselves, and they have no concern with preserving the true gospel message for Jesus Christ. And I want to give you a, uh, maybe a, a, a stern warning here. If a preacher, if a teacher is ever boasting in himself, boasting about himself, run far from that teacher. Genuine teachers and preachers only boast in the cross of Christ. False teachers today, like the Judaizers, believe that they are the ones who save people. People don't save people. God saves people. Paul was making the claim that the Judaizers wanted to avoid the offense of the cross of Christ. If circumcision earns salvation, if any works or deeds earn salvation, then the atoning work of Christ on the cross was not sufficient. If, the, if what the Judaizers were teaching was true, then the Son of God, willingly laying down His life even unto death, was not sufficient payment for the sins of believers. If what the Judaizers was teaching was true, then Christ was lying when he said, it is finished. They were teaching the cross plus works for salvation. And the way to escape the offense of the cross is to deny the power of what happened on the cross. The way to deny substitutionary atonement, which is Jesus in my place, is to preach legalism as a way to earn salvation. Legalism rejects the sufficiency of Christ. Legalism is man-centered. Legalism is adding human rules and, and treating them as divine requirements for salvation. So we have to establish what legalism is. Legalism is adding human rules and declaring them as a divine requirement for salvation. We must reject this. But I feel like I have to clear some things up about legalism. There is so much misteaching on what legalism is. There's a misconception about what legalism is. Pursuing holiness is not legalism. Pursuing righteous living, that is not legalism. And I think because our, our uh, local area, our local context, we see a lot of actual legalism, and we should rightly want to run from that. But I fear that we've entered another ditch. We, we've entered this ditch where we believe that any calling to holiness and righteousness is legalism. And we have to make sure that we do not believe that. So here's some examples of legalism. We requiring a set of rules for dress that are an extra biblical requirement is legalism. Restricting modes of transportation as a condition to be a believer, that is legalism. Obligating church members to go to confession with a priest is an extra biblical requirement. That is legalism. 
selling indulgences to atone for sins. This is legalism. These are additional requirements, extra biblical rules instated by churches and people. That is what legalism is. Church, living above reproach is not legalism. Calling other believers to live lives above reproach is not legalism. Pursuing holiness and actively killing off sin is not legalism. To bring glory to God in the name of Christ should be the pursuit of every Christian. And it's not legalistic to desire and pursue conduct that brings honor and glory to Christ. There is a real and significant difference between legalism and living a life for the Lord. And we must not confuse these two things. Church, don't fall into the trap of believing that repentance and godliness is legalism. Obedience is what we are all called to do as Christians. False believers, false teachers use this tactic to minimize and justify their own sin. They use the accusation of legalism as a way to pervert the grace of God into a license for immorality. I'm going to keep popping these just so you know, or else I'm going to be coughing. There's a big difference in the hearts of people who trust their own ability to fulfill extra biblical requirements for salvation. Those people are legalists. That's different than those who trust in a sovereign God to grant them salvation through grace. Genuine believers trust in grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And the result of that is humble submission to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ earnestly desiring to bring glory to him in everything we do, everything we say, and how we act. You see, a true believer protects the gospel. False believers protect and promote themselves, but authentic Christians protect and promote the gospel. We can see the difference between the true and the false. What is the teacher promoting? Is he promoting himself or is he promoting the Lord? The church is the pillar and the buttress of truth. And genuine Christians will risk everything to protect the pure gospel message. 1 Peter 3, 15 says this, But in your hearts, honor Christ as the Lord is holy always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Titus 1.9, we must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may, may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. A true believer protects the gospel it's a noble and worthy calling to protect the pure message of the gospel, to preserve it, and to keep it unaltered for future generations. There's a lineage of people who have gone before us, many who have died to fight to preserve the pure gospel message. And we must live with the same passion and conviction that they did. There is nothing more worthy than fighting for the truth of the gospel. We may suffer hardship. We might have to sacrifice some things in this world. We might be rejected by people. But true believers protect the gospel no matter what the cost. And this brings us to point number two. A true believer boasts only in the cross. Verses 13 and 14. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised 
that they may boast in your flesh. Far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. A true believer boasts only in the cross. The Judaizers worked hard to convert the Gentiles to the requirements of the law so that they could brag about their own efforts. Why were they doing this? To brag about their own efforts. They were bragging about their own works. The the Judaizers, they wanted to avoid the persecution. The genuine Christians were receiving severe persecution. The Judaizers wanted to separate themselves from that. They were bragging in themselves to avoid hardship. And in verse 14, Paul was contrasting what he boasts in and what the Judaizers were boasting in. He says, but far be it for me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this boasting is not a prideful boasting that Paul was talking about. He is simply saying that his only source of joy is Jesus Christ. There is nothing good within him. But somehow, God the Father saw the righteousness of Christ in him. And that is true of us today as well. This is the only thing he can boast of. Paul could take no pride in his work, in his goodness, or his righteousness. None of those things are worth boasting about. But the finished work of Christ on the cross, his sinless life, Jesus laying down his life for believers, Christ resurrecting from the dead, that's something worth boasting in. Paul was reviled at the thought that Christians were seeking approval in the eyes of the world. The same world that crucified Christ. The same world that mocked Christ and killed him on the cross. That's who they were seeking approval from. And Paul was disgusted by it. Receiving applause and acceptance from the world is nothing worth boasting in. Paul was saying, I will take glory only in the atoning work of Christ on the cross. You see, without the cross, there is no resurrection. Easter's coming up real soon. We're going to be talking about the resurrection. Follow me here. Without the cross, there is no resurrection. Without Christ's death on the cross, there is no empty tomb. Without the empty tomb, Jesus wasn't God. And if Jesus wasn't God... That's bad news for us because there is no salvation. But thankfully, all of those things are true. Christ was persecuted. He did die on the cross. The tomb was empty on the third day. And there is salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ for all believers. The Son of God came to earth. Jesus retained all all the attributes of God, yet somehow became a man. He was fully God and fully man. He willingly submitted to the will of God the Father to be despised and rejected by people. Christ came under the law to fulfill the law on our behalf. He lived a sinless life. He died a sacrificial death. And he rose from the dead on the third day. And now he sits at the right hand of God the Father, interceding on behalf of of all of us believers. This is the only thing Christians can boast in. A true believer only boasts in the cross. A true believer only boasts in Christ. Jeremiah 9, 23-24 says this, the prophet Jeremiah, often you'll notice the words of a prophet because of this first phrase, thus says the Lord, he's speaking on behalf of God. Thus says the Lord, not let the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. 
Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. The Lord declared that he delights in those who understand and know him. He delights in those who boast in the work of Christ on the cross. And Paul says at the end of verse 14, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. He's stating, the world is spiritually dead. The world is in opposition to God. Paul is making it clear. The world has no power over him anymore. He's refusing to be influenced by the world. What the world has to offer no longer appeals to him. Can we say that with a true heart, that what the world has to offer us no longer appeals to us? Paul was done serving the ways of the world. He only serves Christ. He's only boasting in the cross. So I want to ask you this morning, how about you? Are you boasting in things other than Christ? Are you boasting in your wealth? Are you boasting in your career? Are you boasting in your kids' accomplishments? Are you boasting in your works? It's good for us to earnestly and honestly evaluate ourselves. God's word is good at this. It's good at revealing truths and convicting our hearts and giving us an opportunity to ask ourselves these questions. Are you seeking approval in the eyes of the world? Do you want to be accepted and applauded in the eyes of the world? How about this one? Is the approval of people more important to you than the approval of Christ? Are you ashamed to look different than the world? Do you believe that somehow you can have the saving faith of Jesus Christ and be saved without declaring him the Lord of your life? Do you believe that you can live like the rest of the world? and be a true follower of Christ. Church, we must be willing to submit to the will of God the Father the way Jesus modeled it to us. It might be hard, but there is no greater honor than to lay down your life for the gospel. Sinclair Ferguson says this, when Paul preached the cross, he preached a message which explained that man's means of bringing death to Jesus was God's means to bring life to the world. How God used the, or how man used the cross to kill Christ on the cross, that was man's ways. But what God did with that was to provide a way to save the world. Man's symbol of rejecting Christ, that's the cross, was God's symbol of forgiveness of man. This is why Paul boasted about the cross. A true believer boasts only in the cross. This brings us to our last point today, point number three. A true believer is granted peace, mercy, and grace. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. 
Paul starts here by restating whether one is circumcised or not has nothing to do with regeneration. To be saved is to be a regenerated person, a new creation. And this has nothing to do with circumcision. This regeneration or new creation is an act of God where He grants the gift of eternal life. Through faith in Jesus Christ, Christians become children of God. We become new creations. And although circumcision is what Paul was pointing out here, he could have pointed out a hundred other ways that people believe they earn their works, they earn their salvation through works. Salvation is just the one thing that he's addressing to the Galatians. But the overall theme is works. Circumcision was just the example of works-based teaching that Paul was addressing. But when Paul goes on, but then Paul goes on to say, and as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the God of Israel. Only believers who understand that their, that their salvation depends on Christ alone will have peace. I see the prayer requests every week. One of the common themes is, please give me peace. People are praying for peace. Only those who believe that their salvation depends on Christ alone will have peace. I've been saying this for weeks. There is no peace without the assurance of grace. Peace is something that everyone desires. Turmoil, distress, and anguish are the opposite of peace. I've never once heard someone pray for those things. There is mental exhaustion that takes place when you believe you can lose your salvation. I cannot overstate enough how much unrest and anxiety exists in people who believe they can lose their salvation. There is no peace without the assurance of grace. This is because deep down, when we're honest with ourselves, at night when we lay down and close our eyes, we know the sins of our hearts. We know that if our eternity depends on us, if God is judging us strictly based on our words, our thoughts, our actions, we have no chance. A works-based view of salvation often turns into this cycle. There's this cycle of sin. And then the person believes that they try to work, work, work to earn favor with God. Once they believe they've done enough good to outweigh that sin, then they're good. But guess what happens next? Now they sin again. Now they work, work, work to earn favor so that they will see, be seen well in God's eyes again. And then they sin. And this is a cycle that goes on and on and on. It's never ending. It's exhausting. And eventually, people get to the point where they just give up. They give up on the faith. They quit trying. They realize they can't do good enough. So why do I even try to please God anymore? I can't do it. There's no peace because they believe their eternity is constantly in limbo. And ultimately, they decide they might as well just live how they want because no amount of trying to earn salvation is good enough. Church, I've seen this played out time and time again. This testimony I've seen in loved ones who have lived this cycle for decades to the point where they, got, where they just said, I'm done. It's heartbreaking. But church, we don't have to think this way. We can have peace and we can be assured of our salvation because of what Christ has done. I have news for you. You're not good enough. I'm not good enough. I can't earn it. But Christ was good enough. He is good enough. And we can be secure in that. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. How do you have peace? God gives it to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. 
we can have peace through Jesus Christ. Peace is a gift that God gives to those who are truly his. God gives us peace because he is merciful to his people. 1 Peter 1.3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. Who has caused us? He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In Scripture, we see mercy is given to sinners in the form of forgiveness. Mercy is given to believers from God to those he has compassion on. Mercy is poured out by God to spare us for the penalty of sin which we deserve. Now, mercy and grace are often confused as the same meaning, but they don't actually mean the same thing. Mercy is God withholding the punishment that we rightly deserve for our sin. We deserve an eternal death that is apart from the goodness of God, paying the punishment for our sin. God's mercy spares us from that. Grace, on the other hand, is God pouring out blessing to sinners, a gift we don't deserve. The gift is grace. The free gift of, of, uh, is grace. The free gift that God gives us that we will inherit eternal life, that is grace. Mercy spares us from the punishment. Grace ensures our eternity with him. And when God saves a person, he extends both mercy and grace. In salvation, God does not give one without the other. Through faith in Jesus Christ, Christians experience both mercy and grace. And Paul wraps up Galatians in verses 17 and 18. He says, from now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Paul's body is marked with scars and bruises. There's physical evidence on his body of what he suffered to, to preserve the pure gospel. These are a badge of honor that mark him as Christ's faithful servant. He's endured imprisonment. Paul's endured beatings and punishment. He was tired of the conflict. Paul was tired of the controversy. He didn't desire to be addressing false teaching anymore. He was worn out. Paul is pointing out, I have battle scars. I don't need any more to prove my devotion to Christ. But his conviction to preach and preserve the true gospel would never let him rest. Until the day of Paul's death, he would suffer. He would lay down his life for the gospel. Paul was tired He's beat up. He wants to quit, but he has to continue on. Are we that committed to Christ? Are we that faithful to the gospel? Are we willing to stand firm in our faith when the world is mocking us? Are we willing to suffer, suffer battle scars because we believe so earnestly in the word of God? The gospel is worthy of such devotion. Jesus Christ, our Lord, is worthy of such devotion. The genuine gospel message that we are saved by grace through faith, and this is not of our own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. That message must be preserved. That message is worthy of fighting for. Romans 11, 5 through 6. So too at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. 
Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. You can't change the definition of grace to fit into what you want it to believe. The gospel message of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ cannot be tampered with. The false are plentiful. There will be many who come who try to alter the gospel. Some of them will sound convincing and they're persuading. Some of them will say many of the right things and even do many of the right things. Some of them will go on for long periods of time before they're exposed. Imposters of the faith can go on deceiving people for a long time. But eventually, the true is distinguished from the false. Time and truth go hand in hand. And the true believers will be the ones who experience mercy and peace because of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm going to close with a quote from J.I. Packer. It says this, I need not torment myself with the fear that my faith may fail. As grace led me to faith in the first place, so grace will keep me believing to the end. Faith both in its origin and continuance is the gift of grace. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ who came to earth. He laid down his life to submit to your will, to atone for the sins of each believer. I'm thankful for the Apostle Paul who penned this book of Galatians that we've studied for the last few months. God, thankful for your truths that you preserve throughout time. God, I'm thankful that we are saved by grace through faith. God, help us to be humble in our belief of that. Help us to humbly see that you have poured out mercy and peace upon us. And may that motivate us to be on mission for your kingdom. God, I'm thankful for this church. I'm thankful for this church body. God, would you build us up? Would you encourage us? God, would we walk in your ways no matter what the cost? Would the Holy Spirit that lives within us equip us for all things? Pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's stand up together. We're going to head out of here really soon. We're going to spend some time.